right, so just want to welcome everybody in person and online, and uh, today we're going to, this is still session 16, Renewing the Mind, this is part nine, we've like, <laughs> this is like the never-ending uh, series. I, I hope to end this uh, Indwelling Life series in January before we go to Africa in February, so this is about, we've been talking about uh, getting set free from the root of rejection and things like that, and uh, I've really appreciated, I've gotten a lot of feedback about how much this teaching has helped them, and it's like I had no idea <clears throat> that the reason I did these things was because of a root of rejection. I had no idea that I was defensive. I had no idea I was judgmental or uh, independent be, be, until I realized, okay, I'm doing this be, as a reaction to rejection. I'm doing this in response to rejection, and it's like really eye-opening, and when it's eye-opening, you can catch yourself now when you feel rejected so you don't go into this tailspin of rejection that could take you out for two weeks or two months and you realize, no, God is for me who can be against me and I'm not going to respond to that rejection. I'm going to respond by knowing God is for me and not against me. God's love sets me free. And so this session I'm going to talk about how to be healed from and delivered from a root of rejection um, and for me, what happened when I had that root of rejection, what really brought deliverance and breakthrough for me was entering into a bridal relationship with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, that's weird for guys. You got to understand, even coming out of my mouth, like entering into a bridal relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, guys struggle with that. It's easy for ladies, but I remember when I was writing one of my book, The Eternal Blueprint, and... Um, I was calling women the sons of God, and the editor was a woman, and she wanted to change it to sons and daughters. I was like, no. I was like, if we're going to be called the bride of Christ, you are going to be called the sons of God. If I'm going to be wearing a white wedding dress and having to like talk about flowers and perfume and all this stuff, you're going to have to talk about being sons of God. And so, anyway, I, didn't, I, didn't, I did not accept her change. <clears throat> but... You know, guys, you know, guys really struggle with this, and girls, ladies don't, but guys do, most guys do. But I just want to tell you, for me, if when, I, when I got over the awkwardness of, okay, a bridal relationship with Jesus Christ, and I got over the fact that I'm not having to kiss a Jewish man with a beard, or I'm not having to wear a wedding dress, none of that's not what it's about. It's about a relationship with God. Uh, I remember one time I was talking to somebody about this, and this guy was like, he, he was really like one of the, I don't know, I, it just seemed like the type of guy that, you know, rode motorcycles and just gruff and stuff, and I was talking about the bridegroom and bride, and he was like, yeah, man, you know, he loved the Lord, he really loved the Lord, he's like, yeah, I just don't get that whole bridal stuff, I, I'm sorry, man, I just can't connect with it, and I was like, man, I understand um, this is not about like Hallmark movies and roses and perfume and flowers and dresses and stuff like that. This is about you being in a, in a relationship with the Lord, a, a, a union with the, the Son of God through the Holy Spirit, and um, entering into a bridal relationship. It ain't, and when a lot, of, a lot of Christians don't really understand even what it means to enter into a bridal relationship, but a relationship that's, that's centered around spiritual union with Christ that you are one spirit with him. You are, you are in Christ. You have been identified with Christ. You are one spirit with him. And this relationship where you, you, you begin to experience the love of God expressed to you in a personal way, and you realize, oh my gosh, he loves me. You know, it's, it's more than just singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He actually loves me. And when you... When you experience that in a personal way, it changes your heart deeply. And that's what I'm talking about. And the more and more we enter into this bridal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ through the indwelling Holy Spirit, we've got the spirit of the bridegroom who dwells within us. The more we enter into that bridal relationship with Jesus Christ, the more we are transplanted from the soil of rejection into the soil of God's love. The more we are transplanted from, when we are planted in the soil of rejection, we're going to bear the fruit, the ugly, nasty fruit of rejection, rebellion, independence, inferiority, insecurity, defensiveness, judgmentalism, jealousy, envy, uh, hopelessness, def uh, hardness, 
uh, all those different fruits, jealousy, all those different things that come from the root of rejection, we produce the fruit of that when we are in that soil. But if we will enter into a bridal relationship with Jesus Christ, we will be transplanted in the, into the soil of God's love, and we will produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of love and joy and peace and, and goodness and kindness and gentleness and self-control. And so as we do this, as we enter into this relationship with Christ that's centered upon spiritual union, just, just realize this. Your spirit literally is touching God right now. Your spirit, if you're born again, your spirit is literally touching God right now and is always touching God. The spirit of Jesus Christ has been grafted to your human spirit. You are never not connected to him. That means when you pray, you pray from connection. You don't pray for connection. You're not struggling in your own self-power to get connected to Christ. You pray from the reality that you are connected to Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says that when any man turns to the Lord or when any person turns to the Lord, he is one spirit with him. Your spirit literally has been joined to the spirit of God. He has been grafted into your human spirit. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit now are one. You now, and, and listen, the spirit, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the bridegroom. He's the spirit of Christ, who is the bridegroom. You are one spirit with the spirit of the bridegroom. Literally, your spirit is touching him right now. And you live from that place of union. You live from that place of experiencing his love for you in a personal way. We, we, we were talking on our forerunner call yesterday, and we were just talking about, I love how what uh, David said in Psalms 139, and he was talking about the Lord and, and the way the Lord is for him and the way the Lord thinks about him and how David was saying, Lord, you are intimately acquainted with all of our ways. And I was sharing the story about, and I'm sure you've all heard the story like a hundred times, but let's make it 101 for you. Uh, but it was about this time 25 years ago, and me and Angie had met, and we, we knew, okay, God had brought us together. And we were, we were you know, I knew, okay, I'm going to propose to her soon, but I wanted to buy her some kind of a present beforehand. And I remember I was talking to my boss and I said, okay, where can I go get a, you know, some jewelry for her? And he said, I go to James Avery Craftsman. My wife loves it. So I remember it was a cold, really cold day. And I went in there. I was grumpy. <laughs> By the way, God answers prayer when you're grumpy. I was grumpy and I went in there. And I was like, Lord, okay, show me what you want me to buy. And I walk in and I, I see this. And, I mean, if you know me in shopping, I'm, I hate shopping. So I walk into this, and I see this showcase, and there's this cross pendant in this showcase of two nails uh, melded together. It's this gold cross pendant. And I knew it was like, almost like, I don't know even what it was. I knew I have to buy this. I knew I had to buy this. So I, I bought it for Angie, and we met that night. And she was like, when I gave it to her, she was like, she was really freaking out. I've never seen that before. She was like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. You know, did you talk to anyone? And I was like, I, I was grumpy, had a conversation with God, not sure he heard. But that him, did you talk to my mom? I was like, no, I did not talk to your mom. That would be really awkward. Uh, you know, I'm buying this because your mom told me to. So I was like, no, I didn't talk to your mom. So I give it to her, and she's just like, oh, my gosh. Did you realize, you, don't, you didn't know this, but three years ago, three years ago, I went into James Avery Craftsman, and I prayed Lord, let the man that I'm supposed to marry buy this cross pendant for me. The one she saw was silver, but she wanted gold. Lord, let the man that I'm supposed to marry buy this, this cross pendant for me. And she was in James, James Avery Craftsman, um, but she wanted gold. And here I am, not, I mean, this doofus person walking in in a bad mood, have no idea at anything. 
God, you know, literally, if God can speak through a donkey and he can use me, he can speak to you. I walk in, God leads me to this, and, you know, it's just like really freaking out. <laughs> Amazing to see that God is intimately acquainted with all of your ways. <laughs> I mean, just amazing. When, when, when we saw that, it was like it blew us away that God's love is like that for us. And he's like that for you. And just, you just seek him, you know, seek him about it. We, um, a lady was sharing on our call yesterday how uh, there was a prophetic word released several years ago. And the prophetic word was from Isaiah chapter 62. And the word was that, that God delights in you. And the word was, tell my people Hepzibah. Hepzibah. I'm probably saying it wrong in Hebrew, but Hepzibah. And, and, and this lady was talking about how she began to pray that, Lord, show me how much you delight in me. Show me that I am Hepzibah to you. And she was saying that after she prayed that, just, I don't know, some time went by. Again, if she listens, I'm probably butchering the story too. I butcher stories. But she, she, she had a flip phone. <clears throat> Late girls in the back, do you even know what a flip phone is? Okay, good. So, what's that? Not the modern flip phone. The kind that, like, you know, you, you can't even text because it's like, you know, I mean, yeah. This, this modern flip phone, a, a, a dinosaur flip phone is when dinosaurs roam the earth. It's when cassette tapes and dinosaurs and flip phones. And, and, she, and all of a sudden, this picture, she didn't even know how it happened. This picture showed up with her daughter on it, and it said Hepzibah and, and with an exclamation point. She's like, I have no idea how in the world that happened. It's like God was showing her his personal affection to her revealed in a unique way. And that's what I'm talking about. When you enter into this bridal relationship with the Lord, he shows you in these unique, incredible ways how much he loves you. I remember, too, uh, you know, we used to have uh, Jeff Burke, who would, um, he's gone on to be with the Lord, but he was the most anointed prophetic minister I've ever seen. And he called himself the fat, bald-headed man from Alabama. And yet, when he would, he would prophesy over people, it was, it was amazing the words he gave. I mean, he would know names. I mean, probably a lot of you remember him. Uh, I, I remember the first time he came. I'm probably butchering this story, but I think Drew was hiding behind a pole in the old building. Is that right? Okay, yeah. Hiding behind a pole in the old building going, oh gosh, help him not to see my sins. And then he would prophesy over people and he would rhyme and all this stuff. And, and just seeing the words that he gave to people was so amazing. This one, this one story he told a, a lot, he was in West Virginia ministering and he saw this vision of this rib and this, uh, f- just this gigantic finger tickling the rib. And, the, and he's like, tell that woman in the back row, God's going to get you goo. And he's like, what? God's going to get you goo? He's like, she's going to think I'm crazy. And so anyway, he said, ma'am, I don't even understand this, but the Lord told me to tell you God's going to get you goo. And she just uh, broke down bawling in tears. Everyone else was laughing, and he's like, I've humiliated her. I've totally disgraced her. And afterwards he found out, Her husband's nickname was Goo, and she had been praying for years that God would turn him back to the Lord. And through this prophetic word, the Lord was showing her, I am intimately acquainted with all of your ways. I know you. I know you by name. My point is, when entering into this bridal relationship with the Lord, the Lord expresses his love for you. The Lord shows you in unique, personal ways, like, I am in love with you. I am pursuing you. I am after your heart. I am, I am pursuing you with all of my heart. And as you, as you experience God's love, that you, you begin to enter into this intimate relationship with the Lord, this conversational intimacy where you're sharing your heart to the Lord. He's sharing his heart with you, the secrets of the Lord with those who fear him. And, and the more we enter into that relationship with the Lord, the more we are transplanted from the root of rejection into the root of God's love to where we realize, you know, if God is for me, who can be against me? And I would prefer not to be rejected, but if those people reject me and the God of the universe, the King of kings and Lord of lords, 
isn't madly in love with me and is pursuing me and I'm in a relationship with him, it doesn't matter if they reject me or not. I mean, I prefer not to be rejected and no one likes to be rejected, but even if they do, God's love anchors me and I am rooted and grounded in the love of God. So let's, let's turn right now to um, Ephesians chapter 3. We're just, just going over this, this scripture over and over and over. And again, just make this your prayer. Make Ephesians 3 your prayer that you pray regularly, that you pray often, asking the Lord to show you the, uh, the revelation of the love of God. It, it's, it's meant to be a prayer. Paul's praying in verse 17 that, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you being rooted and grounded in love, the root systems of your soul going down deep into the soil of God's love, because whatever your root system is planted into will be the type of fruit you produce. If your, if your root system goes down into the soil of rejection, you're going to produce the fruit of rejection. If your root system goes down deep into the soil of God's affection for you, his personal affection for you, that goes way beyond Jesus loves me, this I know, but by a, through a revelation of God communicating his personal affection for you and you experience that and know it, then what happens is your root system begins to go down deep in the love of God and his love for you that you may be rooted and grounded in love, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth. In other words, what Paul's saying is the infinite love of God. God's love has no end. It has no beginning. There is no end to the infinite love of God. And Paul's saying this kind of love cannot be known by knowledge. This kind of love cannot be known by a five-point sermon. I cannot get up here and tell you here's... L-O-V-E, love sta L stands for, I don't know, you know how they do that in some of those traditional type churches, L-O-V-E, the acronyms. That is not gonna, that's not what he's talking about. <laughs> he's talking about not, the, not an, a, a five-point message about love that's, that's communicated by information. Paul's talking about, no, you've got to experience. He's talking about experiencing some people are against experiencing God for some reason. This is exactly what Paul's saying. No, I'm not talking about knowledge that you may know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. I'm talking about experience. Begin to pray for God to give you a revelation experientially of the love of God, of, of the kiss of God upon your heart, of his personal affection for you, how he feels about you, so that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. What an incredible scripture that is. And so, like I said, entering into a brighter relationship with Jesus Christ delivered me from the root of rejection, healed me from the root of rejection. And, and here's the thing that, about this, is when you were born again, not only did the Spirit of Christ come and graft himself to your human spirit, not only are you one spirit with him, but Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians 11:2 2, that you were at that time betrothed to Jesus Christ. You have been already betrothed to Jesus Christ. It's not a future event. It happened when you were born again. You are betrothed to Jesus Christ. Paul said for I'm, in this verse, in 2 Corinthians 11 too, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I may present you as a pure virgin. You are already betrothed to Jesus Christ. Your betrothal is not for the future, it's now, yet most Christians don't live in the reality that they are betrothed to Jesus. They are engaged to Jesus. He's your fiancé. They treat it as if it's some kind of a theology or a doctrine that has no practical, experiential application in their life. And, and it's like, no, that's nonsense. You're meant to live in a bridal relationship with Jesus Christ. And what that looks like. You know, we, we talk about Revelation 19, 7 through 9 all the time. 
Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. That is the ultimate intention of God's heart is to have a bride for his son. And you have been chosen to be part of that bridal company. You are betrothed to him. And yet we live as if that has no practical meaning in our life. But living in a bridal relationship with Jesus Christ is not just reserved for heaven. Get this. Living in a bridal relationship with Jesus Christ is not just reserved for heaven. It's meant to be the way we live in relationship with Christ now. Through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Ask yourself an honest question. Do I really have a bridal relationship with Jesus Christ? Most when I say this, I mean 99% of those who are born again don't have a bridal relationship with Jesus Christ. What kind of relationship do you have with the Lord? You know, do you know the Lord? You know, every believer knows the Lord as Savior. You know, we know the Lord as Savior. We relate to him by saying, Lord, you are my Savior. You have, you have saved me from my sins. You have imputed the righteousness of Jesus Christ to my account. You have imputed the, the death of Jesus Christ to my account. Therefore, you have credited that to my account. Therefore, I am justified. Therefore, I am delivered from the wrath of God to come. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Therefore, I have been forgiven. My sins have been forgiven. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. You can't even be born again if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior. Most, I mean, you, you, so I would say every believer has, a, every true authentic believer has a relationship with Jesus Christ as their Savior. Probably fewer have a relationship with Jesus Christ as their Lord. Because when you have a relationship with him as your Lord, as Lord, is you're not living for yourself. You know, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So, O obedience, to God, obedience to the commandments of God, obedience to the voice of God is how we have a relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord. We want to be his bondservants that do exactly what he says. So, you know, everyone has a, every believer has a relationship with, with Christ as, Lord, as Savior. Fewer have a relationship with him as Christ as Lord and even fewer have a relationship with Jesus Christ as king. When you have a relationship with Jesus Christ as king, you are very much aware of his dominion, of his majesty, and of his sovereign rule. You are very much aware of the power of God that is given to us right now to advance the kingdom of God through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You are even aware that Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth to take dominion over the entire planet as King of kings and Lord of lords. And when you have a revelation of Jesus Christ as king and your role in the kingdom, what happens is you begin to live wholeheartedly seeking the kingdom of God first, pursuing the kingdom of God first. So every believer knows him as Savior. Fewer know him as Lord. Even fewer know him as king. And even fewer know him as judge. When you know the Lord as judge, it puts a real fear of God inside of you. And we need to know the Lord as judge because the Lord has eyes of fire. And the Lord's eyes of fire are, pen in fact, I would say this, if you don't realize the church right now is going through a time of divine judgment in the house of God, you've probably been asleep. Judgment has begun in the house of God. It's not, it's, it's sad. I mean, it's hard seeing Things that are happening in the church right now, I mean, it, it's, it's really tough. And that's just not for them. It's for us. It's for me. Judgment has begun in the house of God. And we've got to know the Lord as judge because his eyes are flames of fire that, that penetrate into the very deepest parts of our heart. And then when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we are going to give an account for everything we did, and not only that, but for the motives for which we did them. I, I mean, goodness, what's going to happen? 
when our works are bur burned up before him, yet we're saved by through fire. We don't need to wait until then to have a revelation of him as judge. We need to know him as judge now. Because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And when we have that revelation of him as judge, it motivates us to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. It motivates us to want to be transformed into his image. So all believers know Christ as Savior. Fewer know him as Christ as Lord. Fewer know him as Christ as King. And even fewer know him as Christ as Judge. But they, by far, I'm convinced, the, the, the smallest number of believers that know Christ as bridegroom. It's a very small remnant. See, when you know Christ as your bridegroom, your relationship is characterized by his infinite love expressed to you in a personal way. See, when you know Christ as bridegroom, you have a deep, personal, intimate relationship with him that's based upon communion and fellowship, and it's based upon knowing the Lord and knowing the secrets of the Lord. See, when you have this bridal relationship with him, is you're feasting on his words, you're dining with him in communion, you're, you're leaning like John, the beloved, who leaned his head against the heart of Jesus, and he heard the heartbeat of the Son of God, the, the very thoughts of God expressed to you. Do you realize you already have, through your spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection with Christ, the ability to lean your head against the heart of God? You already have access to the mind of Christ. You can know God's deepest thoughts. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is about. See, when you know him in this way, in this deep, intimate way, you emerge out of the holy of holies in the secret place with the Lord and you partner with him wherever he goes. It's like the bride in the Song of Solomon. She said, draw me after you. Draw me after you into this place of intimacy so that we can run together in this place of ministry. That the ministry we do comes out of the secret place. If the ministry we do is coming out not from the first commandment but out of the second commandment, we're going to burn out. But if the ministry we do is, is fueled by intimacy with the Lord, then what we do in ministry by the second commandment is empowered by that very anointing. That's the bridal relationship the Lord wants to bring us into. I mean, honestly, ask yourself, do I really honestly have a bridal relationship with the Lord? Am I regularly, and this isn't meant to like, make you feel bad. It's honestly just like, oh, wow, I need to be pursuing this. I haven't been pursuing this. And even as I was writing this message, I realized for myself, this was probably more true of me back in my, my uh, late 20s to early 30s than it is now. And I'm like, I need to go back to that place. And there's seasons in God when God's showing you other facets. There's things, I mean, you, you can't always live in this place of, you know, bridal relationship there's you gotta there's other things God's doing other things he's showing you but I was like I, I made me realize okay I have have I've kind of departed from some of this I need to get back to that place of living in that bridal relationship with Jesus Christ right now see if you are bored in your relationship with the Lord if you if you feel bored most likely if you're bored it's because you're not living in this bridal relationship if you're bored, and you know, I bet if I'm not even going to ask people to raise their hands, but I bet if I ask people, okay, raise your hand if you feel bored in your relationship with the Lord, everyone would slowly be like, yeah. I mean, honestly, it, you know, some, but a lot of times if, if that's the case, we're not in, we haven't entered into this bridal relationship with the Lord. So I, I, just, want, I just want to encourage you this bridal relationship with the Lord, it, it's not just for heaven, it's meant to be now, is do you really have that bridal relationship with the Lord? And I'm going to kind of go in and describe what it is in more detail, but do you have that right now? Um, again, I mentioned this before, just a, just a few words of, of caution. I mentioned this before that, that men 
This is a challenge to men. This has nothing to do with wearing a wedding dress, kissing a Jewish man with a beard, or Hallmark movies. It has nothing to do with any of that. Um, we need to move beyond that barrier and, and get into the, you know, John the Beloved is one who had intimacy with the Lord. He was the beloved of God. He said, I am the disciple whom he loves. And he leaned his head against the heart of Jesus. It was not, I mean, we were talking yesterday on our call. It's like, okay, normally if, two guys, if one guy laid his head against the heart of another guy, that would be really weird and awkward. But he's God. He's God. He's, he's, he's God in human flesh. You know, this intimacy God wants to bring us into. Again, it's not about gender. And, and let me say this as well. This should be stating the obvious, but, but this teaching ha has opened a door to immorality and, and uh, you know, sexual sin. So just want to say this really clear. A brighter relationship with Christ does not entail anything physical, sensual, or sexual. Okay? God forbid the thought. But I just got to say that very clearly because... You know, I'm just going to say this. This message can open up things to that realm, okay? This has nothing to do with anything physical, sensual, or sexual. It's spiritual and emotional, okay? So make sure, make sure you understand that, okay? As we talked about in, in, the, in the eternal blueprint the, about God's eternal purpose, just want to take a step back here and go back before time and creation, before time and creation, before there was a creation, when, when there was not even heaven, when there was not a throne, when it was just the Godhead, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit dwelling in intimacy with one another, God the Father and God the Son through God the Holy Spirit created a plan and a purpose called God's eternal purpose. And part of God's eternal purpose was to provide the eternal Son a helpmate, a, a bride in whom the eternal son would be the lover and the initiator of this love of God and the bride would be the recipient and the responder of God's love and we would give the love we receive from God back to him and we would love Jesus like the father. That was God's ultimate intention. Before he created the earth, before he created the world, before he created the angels, God had this plan, his ultimate intention in his heart to give his son a bride from humanity that would be comprised of millions and millions of men and women throughout the ages who would receive the love of God from Jesus Christ and would respond back to him, loving him like the father. That is it. <laughs> that is why you were created. That is why you are breathing, is you are meant to be in that bridal relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. How incredible is that? And so Jesus was much like Adam in a very highly and specific way, whereas Adam had no help made of his own, and he went into a deep sleep, and God pulled out Eve from his rib and created woman who is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, Jesus, in this highly specific sense, had no helpmate of his own. He had no one, he had no one who was his lover. And so God on the cross put Jesus, so to speak, like Adam, into this deep sleep. And when the Roman soldier pierced his side with a spear and blood and water gushed out, God was forming the church born of blood and water. God was forming the bride born of the spirit who would come from his very side like Eve came from Adam. And God was providing him with a helpmate that would fulfill the ultimate intention of God. You are the betrothed of Jesus Christ into this divine romance. See, the, the scriptures are far more than a history book, far more than spiritual principles, far more than just telling you how to live this life and make it to heaven and how to get saved even. The scriptures begin with a wedding and the, the, the scriptures end with a wedding. They begin with a marriage and they end with a marriage. And throughout scripture, 
through types and shadows and principles and revelation, the ultimate plan of God, the ultimate intention of God for God to give his son a beloved bride from his very own side to whom he would, he would be the lover and she would love him back with the father's love. That's weaved throughout scripture in the divine, what, what people have called the divine romance. Incredible. And Paul was writing in Ephesians chapter 5. And he's saying, talking about marriage, and he's saying, marriage is only a taste of the eternal. You are called to marry the Lamb of God. Incredible. Through the finished work of the cross, you are a pure virgin in his eyes. When you were born again, you became betrothed to him. He is now preparing you as his very own. There's nothing like this in the world. I think it's interesting that when Solomon wrote, he wrote Ecclesiastes in the Song of Solomon. Ecclesiastes says, vanity of vanities. This is Solomon who had everything. He said, vanity of vanities. It's like, I've tasted everything and it's, it's empty. There's no pleasure in this world. And yet he writes, the next book is the song of all songs. Your love is better than wine. And I believe Solomon was a dual purpose, the Song of Solomon, both a love story between him and the Shulamite, but also a allegory that the Spirit of God was writing through him of the ultimate intention, the divine romance between Christ and his church. Now, you got to be careful, of course, reading that. There's... You can overinterpret things, but just to say, when you've tasted the world and all that it offers, you realize this world has nothing to offer that compares to the eternal romance, the divine romance that is in Jesus Christ. So when I was preparing this message, I, I was, you know, I've been... My wife tells me I'm not, I'm, I'm not nearly as romantic as I was when we were dating. Um, anyone else out there besides me? Um, Dylan, okay, cool. Anyone else make me feel a little better? Raise your hand, wives. Okay, is that true? Okay, so I was like, I don't even know what romance is. And she's like, you were so romantic when we were dating, and now, you know, you're not. Um, so I was like, okay, I need to. I don't even know what romance, I guess I don't even know, I thought it was romantic. I watched this German movie in German with you called, with, with English subtitles. I'm like, it's kind of romantic. I don't even know what it is. So, you know, uh, the, also, by the way, this is a side note, just to draw in our younger audience back there, is did you realize that Riz has now become the official word of 2023, Riz? Did you know that? Raise your hand if you knew that. Okay, Riz is the, is the most popular word for 2023, and Riz means uh, romantic charisma, romantic charisma. That's the word of the year. So I have been known that I have no Riz, okay? So anyway, I looked up, okay, okay if we're talking about the divine romance, what's, and I don't really, I guess, I don't know what romance is. Um, okay, what is romance? Seriously, I, I asked Chat GPT, what is romance? So this might sound a little robotic. <clears throat> what is romance? So I'm going to walk through and talk about what is romance, to the, especially to the guys who don't know, and how that applies to our relationship with the Lord. Okay, the first one we're going to look at here is emotional connection and spiritual intimacy. Again, this is, this is we're, taught, we're, we're taught, this is, just say again, the divine romance is spiritual intimacy and emotional connection, not anything physical, sensual, or sexual. But it's, a, it just, it's an emotional connection with the Lord. It's spiritual intimacy with the Lord. And I think about it like this. When David prayed in Psalms 25, 14, he said, the seeker, he said, he didn't pray, he said, he said, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. And this is what this whole relationship centers on is 
the secrets of God revealed to his intimates. The Lord does not reveal everything to everyone, even if they're born again. He reveals his secrets. He reveals his revelation to those who fear him. And so part of this bridal relationship is, is knowing the secrets of God, knowing the revelations of God through his word, through his voice. The, Lord's, the Lord whispers his deepest secrets to his beloved friends who fear him. Daniel being the beautiful example of that. The angel of the Lord appears to Daniel and he says, greatly beloved, greatly beloved of Daniel. That was the word of the Lord to Daniel. You are greatly beloved. You are, you are greatly delighted in Daniel. And what did the Lord do? He unfolded to him these incredible revelations that when scholars read the book of Daniel, they're like, no way Daniel wrote this before they happened when he, he predicted the coming of the Persian Empire and the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire. He predicted all these things in precise detail, even to the point of the timing of when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would come to the earth and die. With, with incredible precision, Daniel prophesied by the word of the Lord because God saw Daniel who prayed three times a day as his intimate who feared him and he revealed the secrets of God to him. I want to be like Daniel. I want to be like Daniel. Do you want to be like Daniel? Daniel's a picture of the bride of Christ, that, that, the intimate one with the Lord. See, the divine romance, the divine romance is centered around a first love relationship with Jesus Christ. The Lord coming to the, the church of Ephesus and he's telling these, these, these men of God, he's saying, you saw, you tested these people who say they are apostles and, you're, and they're not, and you found them to be false. And the Lord was like, I commend you for that. I love that about you. You are faithful to doctrine. You are faithful to the word of God. You are faithfully testing these ministers who claim to be apostles, but they're not. They're false apostles. They, they had their doctrine accurate but they didn't have this intimate relationship with the Lord. They had fallen from that place of first love. Doctrine and the pursuit of doctrine. I'm all for, listen, I am all for doctrine. We've got to have our doctrines correct. We need to have our, our scriptural doctrines correct. But those things can, that knowledge can become substitute for that, that living intimacy with the Lord. And like in the church of Ephesus, the, they had fallen from that place of first love through the knowledge of scriptures and through the uh, through doctrine. See, a, a first love relationship is a, is a burning passion for him characterized by deep desire and affection for him that flows out of his desire and affection for you. We love God because he first loved us. We can't love God the way he wants to be loved without receiving and having a revelation and experiencing his love for us. It takes God to love God. It takes God's love being poured out into us for us to respond back to him. See, the divine romance is like Mary of Bethany. All the great apostles had no idea that Jesus was going to die. I mean, they heard him say it, but they were like, yeah, we, didn't even, we don't even register. Yet Mary of Bethany did the one thing and she sat at the feet of Jesus and she listened to his words and he said, this one thing will never be taken away from you. And Mary was one of the ones that helped prepare for his burial because she knew the Lord intimately. Like David, David said, this one thing I want, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. That's the heart of the bride. Mary of Bethany and David had the heart of the bride. Lord, we want to pursue you with passion, with this emotional connection and this spiritual intimacy. So this divine romance includes conversational intimacy where you're, 
You're expressing your heart to God. He's revealing his heart to you. And it, this fosters, this creates this close oneness and connection with him. And see, we're one spirit with him, but we want to be one with him. Heart, mind, soul. The second thing about romance, the divine romance, is spiritual beauty. See, do you realize this? You can study the scriptures on this. How beautiful the Lord is. Isaiah 4.2 talks about, I love this prophecy. Isaiah 4.2 says that in that day, he's talking about after the second coming of Christ, when he's ruling from Jerusalem, in that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful. Oh man, that is it's incredible. I can't, even, I can't even fathom. I mean, you look at the beauty of creation. And those are the fringes of God's beauty. When the, when the king of the universe, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, is reigning from Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and the nations are streaming to him, and he's shown to be, as he is, beautiful in his radiance, glorious in his appeal, and we see him, he says in Isaiah 33, 17, in that day your eyes will see the king and his beauty. This divine romance is about the pursuit and the hope of this beauty. And Jesus is not just beautiful because of his radiance. Jesus is beautiful because of his nature. Because of his lamb-like lion nature. The sacrificial nature, the meekness and the humility of Jesus Christ. The sacrificial love of Jesus Christ who became the atonement for our sins. And the lion nature of Jesus Christ who is a warrior who's coming back to this earth to take over and to wage war against God's enemies. He's both the lion and the lamb like Matt from England uh, talked about in, in his great message. Hey, Matt, you're probably listening to us. God bless you. Thank you for that great message. The next thing about the divine romance is the expression of affection. Is the Lord loves to tell you who you are to him. I love, I, it's one of my favorite. I, I say it again, I, I'm guilty. I say it every single week. This is one of my favorite. I got like a thousand favorite verses, but I love it when, when, when in, in John, the book of John, John describing himself says that he is, I am the disciple whom he loves. I love that. I love that. I love it that he's just writing this, his gospel down, and he said, Peter came up to the, to the disciple whom Jesus loved, because Peter realized John's more intimate with him than I am. If I go to him, he might say something different, but if I can get John to go to him, he might get the answer. <laughs> and so John says, Peter came to the disciple whom Jesus loved and said to him, I love that, it's so beautiful, the one who leaned his head against the heart of Jesus, the, the bosom of Jesus. It's almost like John had this, this pride about it. I mean this pride in a good way. It was like his identity was shaped because, and it had to come out of this relationship with the Lord and John where John knew the personal affection that Christ had for him and he expressed it to John and John became this intimate, this lover of God. You too were meant to be like John. You're meant to be like Daniel. You're meant to be like Mary. You're meant to be like David where he expresses his affection. And you see in Hosea 2.14 where the Lord is going to allure the Jewish people at the end of the age into the wilderness. And, and Hosea said, then he's going to speak kindly to her. Now, even though it's talking about the Jewish people, it's also the principle is, is, applies to us who are Gentiles is God wants to draw you away into a secluded place and he wants to speak kindly to you. See, there are times when God speaks very stern. There are times when Jesus says to his beloved disciple, Peter, get behind me, Satan. 
There are times when the Lord speaks like he does in Revelation 2 and 3, as I have this against you, you've left your first love, that you gotta, if you don't repent of lukewarmness, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. But when we turn and we repent to the Lord, the Lord speaks to us with kindness and with tenderness and with affection. And in that divine romance that we enter into, that, that, the, the kindness of God speaking, like, I love you, beloved. I love you. You are the disciple whom I loved. You are greatly beloved in the Lord. See, what is the Lord uh, speaking to you? It's, it's just, Lord, Lord, what are you saying about me? What are you saying about me? Lord, show me your affection that you have for me. Lord, you, Isaiah 62 talks about, in that day, the Lord, will, you will be known as the, my delight is in her. So, Lord, show me your affection for me. Begin to pray that. Show me, Lord, your affection for me. Lord, I don't know it. Reveal your affection for me. The next one of, of, of the divine romance is conversational intimacy, where we have this conversation with God, where prayer goes from only being about, okay, Lord, do this. Okay, Lord, do that. Okay, Lord, do this, do that. You know, you, you just pray out your prayer list. And listen, I'm all for doing that. That's important. But we move from only doing that into this conversation with God where we're, we're conversing with him. We're having this conversation. He's speaking to us and we're speaking back to him and we're having this dialogue. I'm not saying... Some people go way extreme. I don't think God is speaking to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Some people claim that. I don't know. I don't experience it that way. But, but it is a dialogue with him where you're, you have this real relationship. He's speaking to you. You're speaking to him. You hear his voice and you're, you're praying back to him. Is, let's look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. This is the relationship that we are meant to have. And, you know, again, if you, feel, if you are lukewarm, if you're bored, probably, if you're bored, you're probably lukewarm. If you're bored in your relationship with the Lord, here's what the Lord says in Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. It was interesting, I was listening to this uh, uh, scholar on uh, Twitter, or X, sorry, formerly known as Twitter. I don't know why they named it X still. That has nothing to do with this message. But it's the worst branding decision in history. But it has no meaning to this message. I'm just going to call it Twitter. He was on Twitter talking about this verse. And he said, you know, and I agree with everything he said. He said, you know, the Lord was not using this as an evangelistic call to call people to salvation. He said he was referencing the Song of Solomon when the Lord, the bride said, I heard my beloved knocking, open the door. And, and also when, when, the, when the bride said, you know, the bride prayed in Song of Solomon 4, come into my garden and eat its choice fruit. And when you apply both Song of Solomon 5 and Song of Solomon 4, this is what the Lord was speaking to the Laodicean church, is that I want to have this bridal relationship with you that will get you and deliver you out of lukewarmness. Isn't that beautiful? Is the Lord said, the bride said, Lord, come into my garden and eat its choice fruit. Okay, again, we're in the spiritual right now. <clears throat> okay, don't go there. We're in the spiritual. And it's talking about the Lord coming into our heart. The Lord coming into our heart. The Lord, it's, it's really what Ephesians 3 talks about, that that Christ may fill your heart with faith, or fill your heart, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. You hear the knock, and the Lord's knocking. I'm outside. I want to come in. And, you know, just, just talking about the way we are born again, he's in your spirit, knocking, but your heart here, you're living for yourself. And the Lord is knocking, saying, let me in. I want to come and fill your heart. I want to come and dine with you. I want to have this, this ongoing communion, this conversation. You know, when you have this dining, 
When you dine with someone and you, you go to a restaurant with someone and you eat with them around the table, you have these conversations that are transparent and real and they're heart to heart. And they're, you know, that's why we love eating with people because you, you say things over a meal that you wouldn't say in a text message or in an email or over the phone. And you enter into this. This is, way, this is the relationship God wants to enter in with you. This is the bridal relationship of conversational intimacy the Lord wants to enter into with you. That, you would, that, that he's knocking, wanting to come in, wanting to come into your garden, into the garden of your heart, and fill your heart, and this intimacy and closeness, this connection that's spiritual and emotional of oneness with him. And he also told the overcomers in Revelation 2.17 that if you overcome, I will give you some of the hidden manna. I will give you some of the hidden manna. What was he talking about? He was talking about the manna that was put into the Ark of the Covenant that was then put into the Holy of Holies. Jesus is offering the overcomers both eternally, but I believe now Jesus was offering, if you overcome, he was offering you a Holy of Holies relationship with him. Not an outer court relationship. Not of knowing the Lord just in the outer court where you know about his salvation and his justification and his forgiveness and his uh, imputed righteousness. All that's beautiful. But we can live in the outer court and not know the Lord. He's, it's not just an inner court relationship known by, by spiritual power and the gifts of the Spirit and illumination of the Word of God. We need that. That's awesome. We need that as well. But he's calling his bride who overcomes into this holy of holy relationship with him of hidden manna, feasting upon this hidden manna that comes in the Holy of Holies of deep intimacy and communion with him, knowing his secrets, knowing his heart. This conversational intimacy. The next thing about, about the divine romance is marked by passion and pleasure. David said, I love this verse in Psalms 36, 8. David said, they drink, again, David being a picture of the bride of Christ. They drink their fill of the abundance of your house, and you give them to drink of the river of your delights. How beautiful. God, and, and the, the New King James Version translates it, the, the river of pleasure. That out of the heart of God, there is a river of delight. There is a river of pleasure that we are meant to drink from. That's what David is praying. I want to drink the river of your delights. I want to drink of the river of your pleasures. See, when we are bored in our relationship with God, our heart is more tempted to sin. But when we drink by the Spirit of God of the pleasures of God, and we experience by the Spirit the pleasures that come of His presence, like Psalm 16 says, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand is pleasures forevermore. There are, if you, when, you, when you've really gotten into the presence of God, you are filled with joy. You, are, you taste of those pleasures. That is meant to be the, the bread you eat on every single day. May I drink from the river of your delights. May I drink from the river of your pleasures. It's like the Song of Solomon said, is, Lord, you know, let me know your love. Because your love is better than wine. Your love is more satisfying than the most intoxicating pleasures in this world. May I know your love, Lord. May I know and experience your love because I've tasted of the world and it's vanity of vanities. I've tasted it all. It cannot satisfy. But your love, there's nothing like your love. Let me drink of your love because it's better than wine. David said your love is better than life. That's meant to be what we feed on in the divine romance with God. I love David. He said in Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord. I mean, does that really characterize your relationship with the Lord? Are you, are you just kind of following through with rote and discipline and all this? Are you, are you experiencing that? That delight in that Lord, that the passion that is meant to be, that's meant to characterize a first love relationship with Him. Delight yourself in the Lord. 
and he will give you the desires of your heart. Isaiah 62, 4 talks about, it's, it's talking about Israel, and it's really talking about the bride in the millennial kingdom in Israel, but I'm going to apply it here as it relates to us. This is what the Lord says in Isaiah 62, verse 4. It, it will no longer be said to you, forsaken. If you've been forsaken, God is saying to you, you will no longer be called forsaken. God will no longer say to you, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, uh, desolate. Here's the word of the Lord to you. My delight is in you. That's the way he speaks to his bride. That's the way he speaks to you when you're pursuing this bridal relationship with, you, with him. He says to you, my delight is in you. My delight is in you. Now, again, if, this does not mean you can live in sin and him, he would say these things to you. Obviously, if you're living in sin, you've got to re you repent, not just confess, but repent. Or you, you change your mind, which leads to a change in behavior. But when you're, when you're really pursuing the Lord in this brighter relationship, he says, Brian, my delight is in you. Angie, my delight is in you. And to him, you're, you will be married. That's, that's the Lord's heart for his beloved bride. That's the relationship we're meant to live in. It almost seems like it's too good to be true, but that's the way the Lord wants you to live. Not in a boring, robotic, again, there is a, there is a very important place for discipline. There's a very important place for consistency and persistence. There's a very important place for doing it when you don't feel like it. I'm not talking about an emotionalism where you only do it when you feel it, when you feel like it. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about entering into, a lot of times, this discipline that gets you into the pleasure. A lot of times, it's the, the rigor of discipline, the consistency that positions you to experience the pleasure that's in God. So both go in hand in hand. But is, is we are meant not just to live by this rote, this boredom in God, we're meant to experience the Lord's delight and his pleasure in, in, in us. Like Zephaniah 3.17 says, the Lord delights in you and he sings over you, that he's rejoicing over you. He's madly in love with you. And, and experiencing that, when you experience that, that, that touch, that pleasure, that passion, that, that, that delight of God's delight in you, it inspires you to love him back like the Father loves him. Because remember, in the eternal purpose of God, he's the lover. You're the recipient and the responder that gives his love back to him. I'll move through these other ones quickly here. Shared experiences, just like in a normal relationship. You, you shared experiences cultivate the relationship. Uh, uh, going on a date, traveling together, um, you know, doing things together, spending quality time together. Um, but in, in the relationship with the Lord, it's like if you don't have this regular time with him, you know, 30 minutes, an hour or more per day, you're not spending that, you're not doing what it takes to cultivate that relationship. And see, if, also, if you've experienced boredom, you're probably not obeying what he's saying in the secret place. Because the bride is meant to live in this place of intimacy with the Lord in the secret place. Draw me after you. Draw me after you. That's intimacy with God in the secret place. And let us run together in partnership. Not just going out and doing something for God so he'll be pleased with you. It's experiencing his pleasure in you first before you do anything. And out of the overflow of that pleasure and that relationship, you partner with him. Whether you partner with him in prayer or whether you partner with him in ministry, whether you partner with him whatever, you know, in evangelism, whatever way God calls you to partner with him, you're, you're doing it with him. You're not just doing it and saying, God bless what I'm about to, about to do. It's like in Revelation 14, talking about the first fruits harvest, they follow the lamb wherever he goes. I want to be that person. I don't want to just do anything. I want to do what the father is saying. I want to do what the bridegroom is saying. I don't want to just say something. I want to say what he's saying. I don't want to just do something. I want to do what he's doing. I want to follow the lamb wherever he goes. That, those, that shared experiences 
with him. When we're doing what God's doing with him, not for him, when we're doing it with him and not for him, we experience the pleasure and the joy that comes in that intimacy. Two more. Mutual respect. In the divine romance with you and the Lord, there's mutual respect. Is the, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. See, fearing the Lord, we can't really enter this bridal relationship with the Lord without the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. We can't really, I don't think you can really relate to God the way he wants to be related to without the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is your treasure. The fear of the Lord protects you from sin. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, to hate what he hates, to love what he loves. Is The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but the highest wisdom is to live out of this first love relationship with him. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. Wisdom ends in this place of relationship, of loving him and living out of first love. But in this divine romance is, is we respect the boundaries God has established in his word. Is God has established boundaries in his word and that's why Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. We, a lot of people have these wrong ideas of what it looks like to love God, and they're living in sin and disobedience. And that's not living according to God's boundaries. God has boundaries. God has configured boundaries, and he set up boundaries that are defined in his word. God's love is defined in these boundaries. So you can't just go off and live the way you want to live, and do what you want to do, and say, well, I'm just walking in love. No, you're walking in disobedience. No, you're walking in rebellion. You're walking in sin. That is not the boundaries God has established. So to be in this bridal relationship with the Lord, we've got to respect and honor the boundaries he has set up in his word. The fear of the Lord leads into this deeper intimacy with him, because remember what David said, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. When we fear him... He reveals his secrets to us. Is we, we honor the Lord and live in this place of honor with him. And then finally, faithfulness. Faithfulness is knowing that, that even if we fail, even if we deny him, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. It, it, it's being confident in the Lord that God is is eternally committed to you. The Lord is devoted to you. He is faithful even when you are not. Amen. Oh, there it is. Lord, just, just receive from the Lord right now. Just, um, I want to pray for us online and in person it, that this teaching would be more than just a teaching. It would be the gateway into experience. That you might begin to take this and, and go deeper in the experiential, the experiencing of a bridal relationship with Jesus Christ. So I just want to say, just, just hold out your hands. If you desire to go deeper into a bridal relationship with Jesus Christ, just hold out your hands. Stand up if you want to do that or hold out your hands. I just want to pray for, I want to pray for myself as well. <clears throat> just online, just receive this. That I'm, I'm just going to ask the Lord to, I, I, even as I'm talking here, I believe as we're getting ready to enter into a new year, this is not a 2024 prophecy, but I just sense as we're entering into this new year, I just, I just believe God is stirring up this message again. I believe that. I really believe God is stirring up afresh this bridal message where it's fresh again, it's alive again, it's, it's, it does something to our heart again. And so, 
Lord, we say yes to this, Lord. Amen. Yes, Lord. We say yes to this. Lord, we just say together, draw, uh, draw me after you and let us run together. Just, just say that. Let's say it together. Draw me after you and let us run together. Lord, as we enter into a new year in a month, may we be found in the place of intimacy, not bored, but delighted, not just lukewarm, but filled with passion. Lord, not just ho-hum, meh, but Lord, filled with delight and pleasure. Lord, let us drink again from the river of your delights. Lord, let, let, a, let first love be awakened in our hearts, Lord, again, in that bridal communion, that bridal intimacy, that bridal relationship with you, that oneness with you, Lord. Draw us after you and let us run together, we pray. Stir up, Lord, our hearts, I pray. Stir up our hearts, Lord, that we would love our bridegroom God as your betrothed bride like never before. Let us relate to you not only as Savior, Lord, King, and Judge, but let us also relate to you as bridegroom. Lord, the Spirit and the bride say, come. We, the, Lord, the bride says, come. Lord, and we just say, come into our hearts before you come in the second coming and fill our hearts with a communion and a oneness and an intimacy with you like we've never experienced before, Lord. And this spiritual and emotional connection with you of oneness, God, that we become one with you in heart, in thought, in emotion, in will, in purpose, Lord. Baptize our hearts, Lord, with your fire. Lord, even like what Song of Solomon 8, 6 says, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. It's flashes or flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Let the flame of bridal love, let the flame of the Lord ignite our hearts, Lord, with passion for Jesus Christ that would root and ground us in the love of God and would deliver us from the root of rejection. Lord, in that place of first love relationship with you, we pray. Lord, I'm asking you, like Song of Solomon um, in, in Revelation 3.20, we, we just say, we open the door of our heart to you, Lord. And we say, come into our garden. Come into the garden of our heart. Yes. Come into the garden of our heart in this place of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, of the love of God. Lord, I believe the prayer for strength, <clears throat> the filling of the Spirit, the filling of Christ in the heart, and knowing the love of God are all connected. Lord, I pray for us that you would strengthen our spirits with power and with might that you would transmit the, the very power of God to our human spirit, that we would overflow in the very presence of God inwardly, Lord, that the presence of God would come into the tabernacle of our heart and fill our heart, that Christ might dwell in our heart by faith, and that through that, that dwelling of Christ in the heart by faith, we would know the length and breadth and, and depth and height of the love of God that surpasses knowledge that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. Lord, let us be filled with Christ. Christ in us, Christ filling us, Christ flowing out of us, Lord. Let us come into that communing relationship with you of knowing your voice, Lord. And Lord, help the men out there to become more romantic, <clears throat> including me. Amen. 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 Hey, beloved. Um, did, did you have anything to share? Okay. So, yeah, um, we'll end that. And then, so, yeah, we got the tithe basket in the back. And then 